And thank you very much. It's really a, a, an honor and a pleasure and a delight to be here. Um, I, w I just want to say uh, a couple introductory things. One of these, one of them is that Cal and Anthony, who's a um, who's a doctoral student at BC, is also a co-author of this, although not officially. So she's pre presenting in a symposium right as we speak. Uh, I'd also like to just refer to the fact that I'm going to be talking about events that happen in the United States, and I know that not all of you are from the United States. So if I say some things that sound really weird, first of all, just assume, yes, this is weird. And then if you have some questions, if one of the questions you have is, what in the world are you talking about? Um, please, please raise the questions. Oops, wait, this is, okay, so this, um, this is, this is talk about toasters, at least on the practice side and how crucially important they are. From an academic side, it's also a talk about the potential contributions of strategies, activities, and practice to a classic mystery of how in the world might academic work actually be pertinent and relevant to practice. What actually happens on the occasions when that's the, when that's the truth? It's also about Elizabeth Warren, who is a US senator from from my state, from, the, from Massachusetts. She, this picture is from when she gave a talk at Boston College in April. She's originally from a lower middle class family in Oklahoma. One of the things that's different about her background is that given what has happened with her is that when she, she was, she actually went to law school and practiced law, not with big corporations, but with smaller groups originally. She's taught in law schools ranging from not that well-known law schools to Harvard Law. Her academic specialty is bankruptcy. But what's most important for our purpose is that when it's in the 1970s, when she was living in, in New Jersey, she once accidentally set a toaster on fire, and, um, and, but it didn't burn down the house. So remember that, it's, if you've had events like that in your past, you can make use of them. Now, I also want to say something that some, she's somebody who's kind of a lightning rod. Some people, uh, very few people have neutral thoughts about her. Some people love her, some people hate her. This is not a time for me to tell you how to think. If, you're ha if you want to have some difficult, if you want to make sure you don't have difficulty classifying yourself, Donald Trump hates her, just in case that, that gives any clues. So this is a part of her academic vita when, at, from Harvard when in 2008. I couldn't get it any bigger than this, but one of the things that's important is that she taught empirical methods. She actually liked collecting social science data. That is not true of all lawyers, including law professors. So, it, this talk is also about two articles she wrote when she was a professor at Harvard Law School. One of them, the second one, was in a law review, so it's a good academic peer-reviewed journal. The first one was in an online open access publication. Uh, and I'm going to refer back to those, but these are two publications and a U.S. government agency that has existed since 2011 called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and how the academic papers led to the agency. I don't know how many of your academic papers have led directly to a federal government initiative, but if you have, you're wonderful. So this is a case, even when people fight about relevance, there could be no question that these were two academic papers that were relevant. But how? And what are some implications for those of us who are academics? So here's the outline. I want to talk about a little about the contemporary relevance discussions. I want to talk about a few events that are pertinent prior to 2007 when she wrote the articles. The means through which her articles led to the Bureau and 
this is with a spoiler alert for any of you thinking, get, being so inspired by this that you think you want to go out and do it. Exploring her relevance through a particular SAP lens and then talking about the academic relevance. But I also want to admit, I tried to figure this out in a really linear outline as I presented there, and I had to give up. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. So this is, this is all outlined, but it's, it's sort of, it doesn't all go in order, so. So, Kevin Corley and Danny Joya say that our theory should be prescient. What prescient means is that it is original, it's revelatory. It isn't just building on incremental things that other people do. This, we say this is something really brand new that's really important. And it should be usefully, useful from a prag pragmatism perspective. It isn't just something that gets in the Financial Times the next day and everybody says, oh wow, Deborah Doherty is really awesome. I mean, although they do that anyway, but. But it's, um, it, it's something that actually speaks to the kind of things that people do day to day. Alfred Kieser, Alexander Nikolai, and David Seidel had a paper in the Academy Annals last year, an amazing paper in which they distinguished between programmatic and descriptive literatures regarding relevance. Just briefly, programmatic literature refers to the topic, the way relevance is usually addressed, which is everything is so screwed up, why aren't we relevant as academics? Descriptive literature is literature they pulled from a wide variety of sources that they couldn't even give a coherent title to, but which they said actually practice does deal with the outputs of management research. So let's figure out what's going on. So this is a partial table from their programmatic approach. And I'll just mention one of the things they talk about, a popularization view that nobody who's a real human being can understand what in the world we're talking about. So one of the things that's really crucial is that there be opportunities for knowledge translation. From a descriptive approach, one of the topics they talk about is the performativity of theory, and notice what they say about it. Management theories can be self-fulfilling prophecies, which means in part they can really screw up practice. That's what their definition of performativity is. But are there other approaches to performativity? One is a paper by Abrahamson, Berkowitz, and Dumez that was in this April's Academy of Management Review that, um, that talks about performativity as just what is it like when academic theorizing does get performed in practice. And they used as the iconic illustration the Black-Scholes formula, which I do not understand at all. all. The only thing I know is that when performativity comes up and people want to talk about it, they always say, oh, Black-Scholes. So if any of you know, you're really, that's good for you. So here's, here's what they talk about with regard to performativity. Um, an ideal situation would be one where an academic gets a brilliant idea, develops something, it gets performed, and then the feedback gets back to the academic world. A more standard situation might be the academic comes up with a great idea, it gets performed, and everything gets screwed up. The most typical situation is the academics do something, whatever, the practitioners do something, and, and that's all we need to say. So, so this is, so I want to start with these two dimensions of relevance as important. Um, how, can, how, why is relevance so screwed up? What needs to be done to make it not so bad? And secondly, what does performativity mean in practice? And I'd also like just to refer to Bill Starbucks' very wise words about the importance of learning from rare events. These are not things that are statistical averages. Uh, so it, it is, I believe, a rare event that an academic starts a government agency 
based on academic papers. And here are some of the things Bill, Bill mentions about them. I hope we'll learn some things today, but let's assume it will be erratic. Let's assume it will have its degree of uncertainty. And let's assume that there will be just a tad a bit of exaggeration involved. And that's OK, because we just called this a rare event. So here is the US, again, I'm saying the US context prior to her papers. There was a housing boom. But one of the things that happened was that some, um, pay, probably not totally scrupulous mortgage brokers, thought, oh, good, we could do really well. And they started vetting all these tr very risky loans to people who had no business getting a mortgage. So the risky loans tri tripled to one third of all home loans. Often, the loan was set up in such a way for the first two years, you're paying this percent in interest. And after that, it skyrockets. But nobody paid attention to that because the first two years are all that matters. But that meant that a lot of unscrupulous lenders couldn't get in. Uh, borrowers often, because of the 22 pages of small text, couldn't understand what was going on. Federal regulators did absolutely nothing to stop this. And to all of you who are not from the United States, this is one of the major instigators of the 2008 worldwide financial crisis. Unlike this book, this was not an act of God. <laughs> this was an act very different. Uh, a whole bunch of people were involved, but this was not something that could not have been prevented. So let's go back to Elizabeth Warren's two articles. And if you are good academics, as I am, what's your first question about the articles? That's a rhetorical question here. But the obvious answer is, what has been their academic impact? What's their citation count? So let's look at the democracy paper. And remember, she was a chaired professor when she wrote them. So all of you coming up for tenure, this is probably not too pertinent. But the democracy paper had a total of 32, as of this was two weeks ago, 32 citations on the web of science and 62 on Ann Will Harzig's public repair, publisher parish. So it's Google Scholar. That's awful. What a useless article. The Penn, Penn Law Review is, is not quite as bad. It had 75 sites on the Web of Science and 425 on Google Scholar. So that's OK, but I mean, you know, this is nothing that dramatically wonderful. But there's this other weird stuff that's written about the articles. Here's this paper from the Legal Scholarship Repository at Penn Law that says the Consumer Bureau had an unusually well-defined intellectual pedigree. It could be traced directly to these two articles. And there's an article in the Washington Post, a newspaper in Washington, DC, that talks about how the Bureau came, was, its foundation was these two articles, especially Democracy Journal, a small lefty quarterly. So this is a different way of saying, does our work have an impact? But I mean, really, what would our deeds think of some, a citation in the Washington Post? Yeah. So let's talk about what she said in the democracy paper. Let's do it the simpler way. She said, basically, It's impossible to buy a toaster that has a one in five chance of bursting into flames and burning down your house. But it is possible to refinance an existing home with a mortgage that has the same one in five chance of putting the family out on the street. And the mortgage won't come with the disclosure of that fact to the homeowner. Similarly, it's impossible to change the price on the toaster 
once it has been purchased. But if you've gotten credit for something, especially for a mortgage, it is possible for the credit, for the, the, uh, the price of the credit to go up exponentially with no warnings at all. Now, this isn't the fault of the consumer. Even though Shakespeare said, neither a borrower nor a lender be, nobody expects that you're never going to pay with a credit card, say to buy a new toaster. Or nobody expects that if you want to make sure that your fingers and toes aren't cut off, that you refrain from buying a lawnmower. But, but that is what's going on with regard to financial markets. So what should be done? What we need, she said, is a new model of financial regulation that's based on the, the model of consumer safety regulation that had been in effect in the United States for several decades. In other words, there's already a model of this set up during the Nixon administration, with Nixon, a Republican president. So he said, why don't we just create this financial product safety commission, just like the, the actual commission. And so this would be like its counterpart with regard to ordinary consumer products. So it's, so it's very, you know, it's a, We've already got a model for this. Why don't we actually do it? And that is basically what we have today. But how in the world do we get from here to there? And how do we study it? Well, um, Linda Rouleau wrote, for my instrumental purposes, a fabulous chapter in the first edition of the Handbook of Strategy and Practice that says you can study strategizing through the narratives people write about their own strategizing. And fortunately, Elizabeth Warren wrote an autobiography in which she talked extensively about this. Which I, so I have, Callan and I have gone over the book several times, and I also have supplemented it with a, informal conversations with a few others who were instrumental in getting the Bureau uh, started, but who are, um, by their request, partly are going to stay totally nameless. But this is actually, we want Elizabeth's story. So what we want to, if we, so in other words, if we want to understand how we are, strat, how somebody is strategizing, one of the best ways is to see how they say they're strategizing. How do they describe what's going on? And what Linda says is that all biographical methods Thank you, Linda, meet this requirement. So that's what we're using, that this is an experiential truth of Elizabeth Warren's life as she is describing it. Whether, it's an, whether somebody else would describe exactly the same thing is another question. The three people I talked with informally didn't always agree on all everything. This means in practice, paying attention to her autobiography and the activities and practices that were involved in turning the articles into a bureau and her framing. So that what I'm going to use as the basic construct here is Sarah Kaplan's discussion of framing and her, dis her discussion of how can I get you to think the way I do? How can I get you to operate out of the same frames that I do? And so, in other words, this is actually very meaningful. How am I transforming what you think is important? Two types of framing. Diagnostic. What's the problem we're dealing with? The problem that Elizabeth Warren was dealing with is why do mortgages lead to bankruptcy for so many people? Fairly straightforward diagnostic. Prognostic is often much more complicated. What's the solution? And her solution was, we need financial regulation that is based on the model of consumer prof safety rather than corporate profitability. One of the things that strikes me as very interesting about 
the Kaplan paper is that it, it's using two of the Bedford and Stowe categories for social movements in terms of changing framing, but it leaves out entirely the part with all the affect. What do I do to motivate you to change? And it isn't just cognitive. It isn't just changing your mind. There has to be a lot of energy. So I just wanted to say that I have never seen Elizabeth Warren in the situations I've watched her on TV or seen her at BC. She is never affectively neutral. Never. Which is one of the reasons she evokes such strong reactions. But I just want to just want to mention that, that for me, this is really crucial to add affect. So let's look briefly at her frames and practices before the article. As I mentioned, she was a bankruptcy lawyer. She taught bankruptcy at Harvard and all the other places that she had taught before that. That was her area of expertise. So while Professor Warren was full-time on the faculty at Harvard, she got asked to be an advisor to the National Bankruptcy Review Commission, which wanted to preserve bankruptcy as an option for families that totally ran out of money, make it easy to get, declare bankruptcy. The commission tried to do that, and it failed. So the report seemed forgotten, so I stayed in the fight by teaching and research. Next set. She's still teaching bankruptcy law. Uh, she and her daughter, who had worked for McKinsey and Company, McKinsey, um, wrote a, you did a lot of social science research and they wrote a book called The Two Income Trap. She started talking more and more about these are the problems. And the major sh thing she did was go on Dr. Phil. Now, I don't know, are there some of you who've never heard of Dr. Phil? Tell me, because I'll, I'll explain it. Okay, Dr. Phil has not made it to Australia, clearly. Dr. Phil, it's a very pop, popular TV show. Dr. Phil gets couples on who are having problems, or they get a mother and daughter on who, oh, the mother isn't nice to her daughter, and so this god awful thing happened, and they, they play it up, and then Dr. Phil says, you've been a complete jerk toward this person. Okay, so. Elizabeth Warren was, let's say her Harvard colleagues were not strongly impressed with her going on Dr. Phil, to put it mildly. But she goes on the Dr. Phil, and she is supposed to, with her daughter, conducting a financial fire drill for some couples that have run into financial difficulties. So I can tell you just one thing that came out of this it was abundantly clear, if you have taken out a second mortgage on your home, you're seriously screwed. So that, that, is, that is Dr. Jean's financial advice for you today. Definitely really helpful. But she, she, you know, she gets into it, she says, oh, I was nervous about how he was gonna talk about this. And then he called on me and then I said, oh my God, it's buff. you're planning on to do financial if you're in trouble. It's so, so awful, the big banks are gonna love you because that's how they make their money, but you're not going to be happy. So she thinks, wow, this was awesome. I've done more in one hour on Dr. Phil to, that I've done in a whole year as a professor. So Dr. Phil calls me back into his office. I'm all excited. He calls me back and says, you are writing for policy wonks. That's not going to do any good to anybody who really needs to understand this. You have to start talking to regular people. Well, okay. There's, there's actually an article in the Boston Phoenix, I think it is, which is an alternative newspaper that says uh, it was at our much, on that much reviled appearance that Elizabeth Warren found her public voice. And I think it's true. So if any of you I think you can probably get it on YouTube if you haven't watched before. You might think about it. So, so this is going to be a lot of stuff that I'm not going to go through in detail, but I'm just going to try to hit top points. And you can see this. And the major frame from this point on, what she's doing more 
is not just trying to understand the problem, but taking steps to deal with it. While still teaching full time at Harvard Law School, but my, guessing, my guess is that her publication record really went down the tubes. So, the, you know, you've got to write offs. So she wrote the articles, she wrote the book with her daughter called For a Lay Audience. Um, it was about this time that uh, uh, there was the, the huge, the Great Recession was happening and some companies were being bailed out, some large companies that were too large to fail in the U.S. were being bailed out. So she was in charge of a committee to monitor how that process was going. Um, and she also started contributing to a, a law, what became a law about consumer financial protection. Here are some of the activities that were involved in this. And one of the things I just, I, again, I'm gonna go through this really quickly, but I just, one of the things I wanna make the point is, if this is gonna be translated, it's not just gonna be her doing it. So, what were the activities and practices that were involved with getting the bill changed into practice? So here is a quick run through. The big banks caused the Great Recession, but they got bailed out. Because of that, Barack Obama was a Democrat, was elected as president and Elizabeth Warren be, became head of the commission that was studying how the bailout worked. During this time, there were a lot of meetings, especially in Washington, D.C., to figure out what can be done to fix this problem. And Elizabeth goes to one of them and says, the one that mentions David, Damon Sil Silver, said, says, I know what can be done. I've written these academic articles. I actually have something to say. And it's better if we all coalesce about one thing. So they said, hey, sounds good to us. So she got some U.S. senators to in, in the U.S. to get a new law passed. It has to be passed by two branches of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So it has to come up separately in both branches, and then it has to be signed by the president, except in a few unusual circumstances. So she was involved in drafting, drafting a bill that involved consumer financial reform for the U.S. Senate, but she also then needed to work with somebody in the House of Representatives who became Barney Frank, and she describes a detail driving over to his house in Newton, Massachusetts, and finding him and what his house looks like, to say, you've got to lead the push in the House of Representatives for this. In the meantime, President Obama goes on TV and talks about we've got to be like toasters in what we're doing. Are there any of you who don't have toasters? Good. Oh, oh, Paul, man, you better get one. Uh, so, so in 2009, the president says, yes, we're going to have a financial reform package, and it is going to include an agency. There, there starts to be an American's financial re reform group that organizes together that says, yes, we have to have financial reforms. The American Banking Association, all the big banks lead this, as she tells it, lead this gigantic effort to make sure there is no financial reform. They're in the halls of Congress every day. They're all, all the lobbyists dressing up really nicely and providing financial incentives to Congress people not to do anything. Former student of hers, Dan Gelden, says this is what you should do and this is the way they're, they're, screw they're making it impossible for you. Congressman Frank finally gets the consumer agency approved by the House of Representatives, although it still hasn't been approved in the Senate, and she gets wind that the Senate is just not going to deal with it at all. And this is what her response is. They were gonna do it secretly. Too bad, too damn bad. If a bunch of senators were gonna pick the banks over families, notice the way she put that, the American public had a right to know. And if we didn't win, we could at least make one hell of a stake. This, I believe, has some motivational framing. <laughs> um, so, the happy story tentatively is that through all kinds of issues, they didn't get exactly what they want. This bill doesn't apply to car loans, so if you buy a car in the U.S., be careful. 
but eventually the bill got signed into law. Yay, except, as you can imagine, she evoked some reactions. And there was a lot of disagreement about whether she should head the agency. And finally, President Obama had to decide, you are not going to head the agency because we would have to get Congress to approve you, and there's no way that is going to happen. So she was upset, but she, he got her to run the agency temporarily to set it up. On July 21st, uh, 2011, it formally came into existence, and she quit that day because she was at the head. And they just had interim heads for a while, but then she ran for the U.S. Senate, and she won, and so she was involved in getting a Rich, Senator Rich Cordroy's confirmation. So, it finally happens, sort of. Let's look at what were some of the dimensions, conceptually. Again, from Kaplan, this is a framing contest. And Kaplan gives some examples. Diagnostic is access is the current rate limiter, so what we do is we find hardware solutions to access. The optical market is saturated for a long time to come, so let's develop technologies for when it's not so saturated. Very straightforward. I th believe she used those, and I believe she did more than that as well. These are all things that were going on, and they were all related not just to her framing, because the framing doesn't necessarily sketch, uh, the way Sarah Kaplan describes it, it doesn't really sketch out what actually happens in practice. And one of the things this group cares about is what actually happens in practice, not just what I tell you. And I, I would like to also, I would just like to comment that there are, there are some people in, the, in my country, or probably in your country, who think if I create the frame, that's fine. I don't have to do anything else. But that's just the beginning. There's a lot that has to happen. So when I just run through a little of this, I'd like for you to imagine yourself writing an article to, to an editor who has just given you a revise and resubmit. When you are writing the letter to go with your review and you are trying to convince the, the reviewers and the editor to come, away, come along to your way of thinking, what strategies would you use? Or you're trying to tell your department chair or your dean, I really need a raise, I'm wonderful. What strategies would you use? And are they anything like what she did? We've already been through this. Huge problems caused by the lack of regulations regarding financial product safety. Prognostic, we could do it, we could fix it. We could create a consumer financial protection bureau that does all the stuff that hasn't been done before. Motivational illustration, when somebody tried to avoid it, too bad, too damn bad. How she just, but that, that also then went along with, how did she describe different groups? She had very clear characterizations of the different groups in this process. I wanted to rein in the financial institutions that were taking advantage of families. Hodgepodge of leaders who were the good guys. She talked often of the good guys. Big banks have perfected the art of circumventing new laws. She hated big banks. The bank lobbyists used a, she hated bank lobbyists. So what, one of the things she was doing was she was doing a very explicit, well implicit probably, huge in-group, out-group dynamics. You're on our side and you're a good guy, or you're on the other side and you're, you're a complete jerk and that's putting it nicely for polite company. But there was a lot of stereotyping, there was a lot of distinctions between groups that really was you're on our side or their side. Metaphors. If it's good enough for microwaves, it's good enough for mortgages. What a great metaphor. A toaster. You can't burn down a house with a toaster. 
One of the things she was doing with the metaphors, I believe, is saying, here is, here is a pre-existing way of thinking. You know, here is this Consumer Product Safety Commission that takes care of things like lawnmowers and po toasters and microwaves and saying we can do the same thing with financial products. We just call them products. Venues for presenting frames. Just imagine if you, anybody but Paul, went on Dr. Phil to give a case for why you should get a raise from your university. I think that could be quite fascinating. And he would bring in your dean and you could talk about it together. But she, went, she talked to everybody she could. News media, Wall Street Journal, multiple consumer groups, especially those that favored the agency. She was all over Congress, talking to congressional aides in Congress. I mean, there's no way I could get this all in. But, but one of the things she, she, was, she was talking about, we, we don't talk much about is media influence, uh, how important that is and the importance of a large range of diffusion channels. And again, I just want to mention, note that this is not all her. These are just a few of the actors that I could put together quickly, all of whom actually were essential to the translation from her article to the, to the Bureau in some way. And these were just a few of the activities and strategies that were carried out in the process. And notice that, that a lot of them were not carried out by her. A lot of them were carried out by somebody else. So she could not by herself take this article, this lefty, lefty online open access publication and translate it. So what are the outcomes? I just want to mention briefly the outcomes as of today. Uh, popular assessments vary. This is a Republican senator from Idaho who was saying that, guess what? They have mass amounts of your financial information. And I'm thinking, based on my experience, who doesn't these days? Uh, but Mother Jones, which is a fairly uh, progressive, very liberal journal says, here are these 10 things that Elizabeth Warren's agency has done for you. And then there are some academic articles too. That This is one of the George Washington Law Review that says, all it said was, this is an independent agency. By definition, an independent agency is bad, so forget it. It's terrible by definition. This article I could find, it's forthcoming in the Tulane University Law Review that actually is a social science assessment. And it, one of the things you can read, among other results, this study includes the following findings. In 122 matters that generated over $11 billion in consumer re redress and foreign, foreign debts, the CFPB did not lose a case in its inception through 2015. That is a pretty clear sign that this was helpful. <laughs> and on, at, the at the Democratic National Convention, this is, this is a brief excerpt of what he she said. She, I, I, all I did was um, I, leave out, I left out some of the more provocative excerpts, um, what she had to say with what she thought about Republicans. But basically she's saying, at the Democratic Convention, they're supposed to hate Republicans. At the Republican Convention, they're supposed to hate Democrats. So it, it, it worked like that. So what can we learn? How do we win a framing contest? I think that's really important. It's one of the things that Sarah Kaplan's raising, and it's an important issue, in addition to just the right frames. One of the things you have to do is be compassionate. And again, I'm learning, saying this just from here, from this example, and competitive as hell. Now, one of the things she might do, because apparently she was actually much more open to people in private, but she just never said it. You have to clearly and publicly identify enemies and friends, very clearly. You use evocative metaphors that link the past with the present. You find all kinds of venues, everyone you possibly can, including the ones your academic colleagues 
think you're a complete idiot for doing to present this, but you also work hard on the details. The actual work of getting something done, as you could see from this quick snippet, is much more complicated than just saying, I think differently. And also remember that other people are working on this. Even though you have the idea, this is not all about you. But I do just want to remind you of this particular comment that, um, that <laughs> um, I wouldn't advise that you all go home and try to do it right on the spot all by yourselves. Maybe you could form a group of people in here to help you. So, the academic relevance. Corley and Joya said we should be prescient and d deal with real issues in the world. She's done that. Alfred Kieser and his colleagues said one approach to relevance is the translation of academic writing. She's done that in spades, using all these ways, uh, all these language diffusion channels, using metaphors, using in-group and out-group and so forth. They also introduced the importance of performativity of theory. And this is quite, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is quite, limit, quite literally a performance of her articles. Even better maybe than the Black-Scholes formula, if I understood it. Um, one of the issues is she was teaching in a law school. Should this have any implications for management academics? Um, this is what she was doing in some way, because you can see that what she did is being written about academically, creating a link, what is more often, a, what it more often being claimed of academics and management schools is that we're doing nothing that connects to practice and it doesn't connect to us. There is, a difference between law schools and management schools in the US, and I don't know other countries, but apparently, I talked with three people who are attorneys, um, they had varying impressions of the relationship between practice and, and academia in law schools, but so it, it makes it clear to me that there are the same fights in law schools as in management schools, one person said vehemently, absolutely, there should be, there, we should be having a direct impact on practice. This is all that matters. And other people said, um, no, although it's built in that their work is closer. And part of the reason it's built in is that law students actually bizarrely read law journals, whereas Management students in the US, at least in MBA programs, are systematically taught that our scholarly literature is useless. I mean, people go really out of their way to say how useless this is. Is this the way it should be for us? And finally, um, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning was that some of what has seemed kind of mysterious really can be studied empirically. And I've given an example of how to do that. So this stuff, I mean, all these claims that, oh my God, are we relevant or not? You know, this is, we're all terrible. It's a, we can actually study what happens. And the, and the materials about framing, about activities, about practice, all of that is directly relevant to giving away into studying this. But just remember that if we're actually planning on doing it ourselves, the activities might be a little more challenging that we might have imagined when we were naively just being good academics thinking about somebody else practicing. So thank you.